Hello, hey random strangers. It's been a while. <laughs> I do hope that you are doing okay or even living your best lives. Uh, it is time though to get back to the very strange land of Hyben and Ren May. And reading through the comments from last time's video, uh, like this one from Osakaki, uh, I am glad to know that asking a lot of questions seems to be the right way to go about watching this show. I do enjoy trying to pass whether there are multiple layers of meaning in the things and the situations that we're presented with. And I am curious to see what kinds of twists they manage to set up and then spring on us. Speaking of layers of meaning, I have been thinking a lot about this point that Ale made, which was to consider Hyben and Renmei not just from a materialist perspective. So, you know, thinking about why this world is structured the way that it is or why it looks like it does from an external point of view, but more from an existentialist one. So what insights can we draw from how our characters subjectively experience this world? And I am actually at this point in time reading a book about existentialism. So great coincidence. Thank you for bringing that up. And it definitely helped me deepen the way that I'm thinking about, you know, what the hell is happening in Hyben and May. Existentialism, as the name suggests, deals with finding meaning in human existence. And as a philosophy, it's kind of hard to summarize in a nutshell because there, there's no real unifying doctrine, but there are some common strands. For instance, existentialists believe that at every single moment, we humans are free to choose what we are and what we're to become. And because we're constantly creating and recreating ourselves through our choices, uh, we are also responsible for everything that we do. And faced with this immense, overwhelming choice and responsibility, we then become anxious. However, at the same time, we become exhilarated at the freedom that we realize that we do have. Existentialists, they also recognize that we make choices within certain limitations. For example, um, our physicality or our social contexts, but that despite these limitations, we can still engage with and interpret and sh even shape our existence as best we can. And in doing so, live more authentic lives instead of, I guess, thoughtlessly conforming to social conventions or pretending that we're nothing but the passive products of our circumstances. Um, so remember in Raka's dream at the very beginning of her falling from the sky, she described this feeling of being fluffy and warm, but anxious inside. It kind of hit me that that captured the existential view of the human condition so accurately. You know, we're constantly having to manage the ambiguity and the anxiety of being both limited by our circumstances, but also free to choose. So it's kind of like this weird, oh man, it's like, it's so exciting. It's, I feel so warm and alive and yet I'm so anxious at the same time. We'll get into some cool, possibly um, existential, highly speculative, by the way, readings of Hyben and Renmei once we get to the recap. But overall, I think that the way the Hibane are thrown into an unfamiliar world makes their entire existence a deeply existential one they are alienated from any memory of their past lives, meaning that they have to figure out how to live basically from scratch, um, how to make something of themselves within the limits of the town and also the rules that the Hibane Renme set for them. Also, the decision to make Reki into a contemplative chain smoker was perfect because you know who else was also a serial, very seriously um, thoughtful chain smoker? Uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, you know, the, the foremost existentialist philosopher who smoked as a way to experience the world. Like he wrote very poetically about how the act of smoking was very intrinsic to how he experienced more fully his food or the theater and ultimately his life's work. So it could be a total coincidence and I'm, I've got my like conspiracy theorist hat on, but it is definitely an interesting one. If the show keeps on an existentialist path, I wouldn't be surprised if in fact there is no ultimate reveal for why the Haibane ended up in Old Home or even 
what lies beyond the walls of the town. Um, because if it were like any other show, you know, we'd probably be trying to guess why things are the way that they are or what the Hibernator and May are planning or scheming. But maybe there is no grand scheme. Maybe the focus instead will be on how the individual Haibane choose to deal with finding meaning in their everyday lives. And what matters isn't why they were born this way, but what will they do now that they're here? And why will they choose to do what they do? In episodes two and three, uh, the world of the Haibane expanded a lot as we saw Raka adjusting to a new life and as we learned more about Glee which is the name of the town that they actually live in and the way that Glee is pronounced in Japanese Gri sounds incredibly similar to the word for grey in French Glee and appropriately it seems like the colour grey is a key motif. Um, for example the colour of someone's wings seems significant in some way. Um, it was a point of interest that Raka's um, wings are a charcoal gray color. Now I'm not sure if all Haibane are born with gray wings or whether Ruckers is more gray than usual, but I do like to think that the gray, um, you know, as in for gray areas, uh, foreshadows some future point where Rucker starts to ask more questions about life in Glee. Unlike the average Haibane who does seem to just accept things as they are, also Raka's connection to crows makes me think that there will be conflict later on between her and the environment that she's in. There was that crow that tried to stop her from falling down to Glee in the first place in her dream. But um, also there was uh, in town when they were watching the communicator with the toga, a crow um, that cawed very loudly at Raka and it just felt very symbolically significant that that had happened, like it was trying to warn her about something. The fact that the crows have black wings seems to correlate with them being uh, scorned by the inhabitants of Glee, whether they're human or they're haibane. I mean, Kana, for instance, she yelled pitch black wings as if it was kind of an insult. And maybe in this town, they are taught that crows are dirty scavengers or that they represent um, an ominous presence that should be gotten rid of. Uh, and there was certainly some weird beef between whatever the crow represents and the communicator who, after the crow had caught out, sort of turned to stare very intensely at Raka before forcing the crow to fly away. And it was almost as if they were having a fight over Raka's soul, you know, like good versus evil and black versus white kind of thing. And the greyness of Rucker's wings um, could symbolize that she's still trying to figure out her identity and where she stands. In fact, Rucker being able to communicate with crows, um, or at least the one that was in her dream, feels very similar to how Harry Potter could communicate with snakes. You know, a main character having a strong connection with a type of animal that is associated with evil but really are just misunderstood and the reality is more complicated than that. It's Ku, one of the youngest and probably the least steeped in Haibane Renmei uh, culture who is open to the idea that crows aren't absolutely awful creatures. So this is when Ku had offered to take Raka to Hikari's bakery um, and they're riding on that junk bicycle, which is in line with how they are only allowed to use old things and Ku mused about how nice it would be if they could fly, putting into sharp focus the fact that Haibane have wings, but they don't function as they're meant to. And it felt like a, a very heavy handed allusion to how one can be human and yet not be living in a way that fulfills your purpose as a human. So then, of course, one must then ask what is the purpose of human existence to which an existentialist would answer you choose you know you have to define what is meaningful for yourself as opposed to other people defining that for you and then you just go and live it and that is essentially what ku said she was like if you really believe you can do something you can so i wonder for if the haibane um who have wings but can't fly if that suggests that in their past lives, they somehow failed to fulfill their purpose or to live authentic lives in the sense that they didn't take responsibility for their life choices. 
And glee is a kind of purgatory where they're meant to fix that. And that this whole show is just one big flashing light to those of us watching it to think about whether we're living authentic lives, you know, whether we're committed to defining our own existence or whether we're kind of just helplessly surrendering to the life conditions that we were thrown into and denying that we have any choice. Immediately after they talked about flying, then the scene cut to some crows literally flying, uh, doing something that the Haibane can only dream of. And perhaps that was symbolic of how there is a price to pay for being free. Crows are hated and it feels like they're kind of being set up as the antagonists. And yet they are the ones who can fly freely over the walls. So maybe the walls represent social traditions that limit how people think and act. And to break free of that requires usually embracing something that is generally looked down upon. And maybe that'll be the central challenge of the story. Um, Again, very speculative, but maybe the point is whether Raka will find a way to free herself from the town, from the limits placed on her um, as a high bunny, and will find a way back to the home that she misses, but doesn't remember, but truly belongs to. So Ku is the smallest out of the older feathers and has probably felt like an underdog for quite some time. Um, She's very helpful and kind, and it might also be because of this underdogness that causes them to be more open-minded about crows. Um, So what is trash to us is food for the crows. She recognizes that everyone and everything has a part to play in this world and that we can help each other by seeing and appreciating each other's differences. People only misunderstand crows because they communicate differently and are often judged by their appearances. To me, that sounds awfully like the situation that the Haibane are in. Um, Ku unintentionally put their finger on what gives me a weird feeling about the Haibane and the way that they're treated, and that is that the restrictions placed on them and on them only feel unfair. Sure, they're not called literal scavengers and chased off with a broom. In fact, the townspeople seem to treat Haibane very kindly, uh, but they are given the scraps of what society has to offer because they are a different class of people, or maybe they're not people at all. Um, They can only wear secondhand clothes, they can only work certain jobs, and they can't handle money. So, um... Look, we will discuss these rules in detail later because I think I came away with a very different, more negative view compared to some of you in the comments, which was great because it really made me rethink my initial reactions. Um, But quickly, for now, um, here is alternative view from Lux Eterna. Uh, So, I am surprised you're so harsh about the system given it's such an idyllic life. Sometimes the traditional ways are best. It's very strange to consider such a life oppressive. Certain ways of life are much better than others. That is a very fair take. You know, there is no indication that the Haibane Renmei are an oppressive power structure or that there is any animosity between the humans and the Haibane. Um, I think the thing that gets me is really the lack of choice. Uh, It's clear that even the Haibane, the older ones, have to just accept that this is how you live and these are your very limited choices and they are bound by these rules and obligations that they don't really know why. Now, obligatory relationships aren't necessarily exploitative. I think me personally, I am just naturally inclined to question tradition or anything really that's presented as a given without any further justification especially if it's enforced from the top down, Um, and especially if it results in a certain class of people being treated differently. Now, maybe there is an explanation that is forthcoming in later episodes that'll make me go, oh, okay, you know, these rules totally make sense. Um, We're just going to have to see. Someone else associated with the color gray, just going back to the gray theme, is Reki. Uh, When Raka went to find Reki, there was that dark gray smear leading into her room Um, Maybe it was the oil from her wings or something. Uh, But regardless, I think um, Grey perfectly represents Reki's melancholy. 
She messes around with the other high bunny and is great with the kids, but in her moments alone, we see that her soul is burdened with something. And it's sort of, it's in the way that her smile slips off her face, like she's suddenly just drifted back into herself and is ruminating on a problem that she just can't solve. And what's interesting about Reki is that she appears, at least physically, to be the oldest in the group. And so I wondered whether how old you appear in this world is related to the extent to which you tend to feel burdened or depressed even. Because in real life, you know, as we age, we all encounter more things that weigh us down mentally and in the worst cases sort of drain our will to live. So what if as a high bunny, that process is reversed? We already know that they're born at different ages um, when they're in the cocoon. So what if the more mentally burdened you were in your past life, the older you actually appear in the cocoon and appear as you're born into old home? And I thought that was just kind of just a fascinating possibility to think about. Speaking of pain, Raka is still healing from having wings break out of her back, understandably. And she said this profound line about how feeling the pain must mean that they are really part of her body. Um, And a deeper reading of that points to how the painful things that happen to us shape who we become and then influence how we live the rest of our lives. Now, I am not a psychiatrist, so I can't speak professionally to how different people respond to pain and painful experiences in their lives. But generally, whether someone can go on with life depends on their ability to find healthy ways to process emotional pain. Um, Pain can become a part of you in different ways, some good and then some very bad. Like you can emotionally shut down and refuse to process pain at all, but it still will negatively affect um, your life and your relationships. Or you can go like the opposite extreme and just constantly dwell on your pain until it's the only thing that defines who you are, which is also not healthy. Um, And then there's the third option, which is the healthier one. And you can acknowledge the pain, seek help if you need it, and then you learn to express it in ways that allow you to heal and then grow as a person. And some people even use their past experiences to help others process their pain. Um, and it's sort of kind of like how the younger Haibane were teaching Raka how to like shift her wings back and forth. Not only was it very cute, but they have all been through that terrible experience of basically having your back explode. So they've had to adjust to the pain and sort of work through it, which isn't easy and takes time, just like it takes time, sometimes even longer time, to process emotional pain. When Raka walked into the light onto the balcony, um, I saw it as a visual metaphor for the ideal conclusion for Raka's journey in old home. I mean, ideally, she becomes at peace with her new body and enlightened as to who she is and her true purpose in life. And it'll be interesting to see whether Raka becomes more like the other Haibane who generally feel like they have a sunny disposition on life and glee, or whether she goes down a darker path of being unable to accept where she's ended up. Maybe she will become more like Reki um, and you know, though Reki is now obviously more comfortable in her physical Haibane body, her mannerisms really make you wonder whether the emotional pain, which the physical pain I think is symbolic of, remains and still torments her more so than the others. Raka compared not remembering the town that she originally came from to the feeling of not really knowing Glee, but the way that she said it made Glee feel more unfamiliar somehow, which was interesting. A newborn has nothing to compare their new surroundings with, whereas the fact that Raka feels lost means that she either doesn't belong here and she needs to find her way back, or that she's going to have to find a way to let go of her past life. And it is another really good analogy for the problem of human existence. And I feel like we all come to a point where we just suddenly stop and ask ourselves, what the hell am I doing here? Where am I? Or who am I? And I think um, we have dubbed it 
the midlife crisis or it's more it's like the quarter life crisis now so like raka we feel like we should be somewhere else or that something's not quite right with where we're at in life or we, that we were meant for another life entirely but we don't know exactly what which is a really uncomfortable psychological state to be in that can then cause anxiety and so people seek answers from all different religions and philosophies to sort out this feeling of displacement but generally and i think that the existentialists would agree with this too um resolution lies not in someone's external <clears throat> ooh, excuse me <laughs> external circumstances uh changing but a change in how they think about themselves and their willingness to learn how to manage that anxiety and deal with uncertainty so maybe as raka goes through how to or learns how to live in glee we will also pick up lessons along the way as to how we can deal with the anxiety of just existing um and i do wonder whether the other hibernate went through that same sense of displacement or longing for somewhere else or maybe even the town that they did come from and if they did whether it just faded away naturally over time as they got used to old home or whether certain high bane are just more predisposed to wonder about where they came from and continue feeling that displacement and sense of unease that they're not really living the life that they were meant to be so the high bane have all crowded into reki's room and we got more evidence that reki tries to be a tough ass but is really hopelessly soft because even though she complains about everyone invading her space, she still hasn't gotten rid of that big table that is clearly an open invitation for them to just come and bother her. Um, we also got more insight into Haibane naming conventions. So we met Nemu, who looks closest to Reki in age, which kind of makes me wonder if her soul is also equally um, old and burdened. And she is named Nemu because she is a sleepyhead who slept even in her dream. An important piece of information was that though we don't know who started the custom of naming a haibane after what they dreamt about, there has been a break in tradition with the younger kids. So instead of a name that describes what you saw in the cocoon, they have names that project forward a dream for the future. So their names actually reflect what they want to grow up to be, or um, in the case of the kid who was called Shota, uh, who's named after Shortcake. It is, I guess, a passion of theirs because I'm pretty sure he doesn't want to become a Shortcake. It's, it was so interesting that the younger kids radiate more positive, uh, active vibes with regards to their names than their older counterparts. We took on names that more passively describe their circumstances before they came into this world. And if we were to run with a theory that the more existential angst, I guess, that you have, the older looking you are as a high bunny, that kind of tracks the younger ones in having this energy to take charge and to name themselves after things that they want to pursue um, are much more aligned with the existentialist ideal of living an authentic life. So there's none of this, um, I was falling, so I guess I'll call myself fall, but more, I want to be a florist and so I'm going to call myself flower. It's like if you are more at peace with who you are and who you want to be, then you get reincarnated as a much younger kid which also has its additional perks. You know, as a younger Haibane, it doesn't seem that you need to go out in town and find a job and you get free food and you can spend all day just driving Reki mad and just running the town ragged. Uh, so it seems like a pretty sweet deal. Like Ragashingo suggested, maybe the lyrics in the ED hold some clues too. Uh, so quote, the first few lines of it felt ominous and sad. Why do you want to forget? Hey, remember the wish of your tears that slide down your warm cheeks. Um, I'm still thinking that their dreams, the things that they're named after, are related to how they died and came to this place. Something you want to forget. A wish that causes you to cry when you remember it. Um, I agree. I mean, certainly for the older kids, that might be the case. And maybe compared to the younger kids, the causes of their deaths in their previous lives are tied a lot more to sadness and regret. 
As for Reki's dream, um, Reki means pebbles or little stones, and the way that she put it sounded very poetic. You know, she was walking on a moonlit stone path and kind of just kept going. And it gave me the sense that she has always been searching for something, but has never, ever found a satisfying answer. And whether that's searching for her life's purpose or for validation of who she is as a person, we don't know. And the dream taking place on a moonlit night, I think, matches Reki's intensely introspective personality. Um, and she did get a bit sad when talking about her dream to the point where the others jumped in to sort of break that somber mood. They were like, oh, Reki's dream was about walking, so uh, let's take a walk into town. And it was kind of like when you're with a bunch of friends and suddenly someone brings up a very depressing topic and the group is at a loss as to how to move the conversation forward. So someone inevitably jumps into it to just change the topic and to lighten the mood. And that scene, again, strengthened my theory that Reki either struggles with a much darker past than the others, or that she is less capable somehow of processing her emotions. And it made me really feel for her, even though at this stage we don't know exactly what's bothering her. Let's talk about the trip to Glee. So Glee is a beautiful, idyllic town. It has like sprawling fields and babbling creeks and very peaceful windmills and that very light strings music that played as I ran to town was very uplifting. And yet the scene was tinged with um, a sense of loss when Nemu talked about how old home was an abandoned school of some kind, you know, a place that was eventually deserted by everyone who inhabited it. And the abandoned nature of old home really felt like a physical extension of the loss that the Haibane themselves experience. They are a forgotten people living in a forgotten place. So were they also abandoned in the same way that this building was? You know, what was it about their past lives that meant they had to be torn away from it and reborn as nameless, unidentified haibane? I remember being surprised about Glee um, with a few things. One, that they are humans. <laughs> and two, that it seems to have a very vibrant economy with lots of people out and about. And even more surprising to me was that the high banner interact with humans on a regular basis. But what struck me too that made me pull back and be like, mm, that doesn't sound quite right, is the way that Hikari said that the high banner have been allowed to live in their town. And I don't know if something was lost in translation, which is totally possible, but as I can only take the English translation for what it said, it was an odd expression that cast a little ominous feeling over the situation. Because to be allowed to inhabit a space implies that they are there at the whim of the humans or whoever put them there. They have been given like a special dispensation that could be taken away from them at any moment. And the hibernators should be grateful that they're even allowed to stay there. And there is that sense of obligation because the hibernators are expected to only use what the humans don't need. Now, what Raka was wearing didn't really seem significant up until this point, but we saw how as soon as she hit town, she became really self-conscious about the fact that she was wearing a daggy hand-me-down that obviously doesn't fit her. It was like a sack cloth bag, basically. So not only did her clothing elevate her outsider status, but it also highlighted this strange rule that restricts Haibane to only possessing abandoned things. For me, this was when the snowball effect of feeling slightly uncomfortable at the system that Haibane live under started to pile up. So Ku, who is very kind and observant, noticed Raka's discomfort and suggested that they go to the thrift shop to get her new old clothes which was when Hikari just casually hit us with the zinger that Haibane can only wear secondhand clothes. So they arrive at the clothes store with that Haibane symbol on it, and I assume it signals places where Haibane can procure goods. And because Raka is new, she got to pick from the better rack of old clothes, but the rest of them, you know, got the old, um, unsorted, dirty ones. 
So they are essentially consigned to living off bare minimum charity, basically. And it's not just only being allowed to wear old clothes. So instead of money, they're issued these notebooks by the Hibana Rent May because they're not allowed to receive money. Again, there's that word. And that was sort of the second red flag for me. So unlike other townspeople, they're relegated to like a barter system where they can only trade labor for goods and it's used goods at that. So look, guys, I got to be honest, gut instinct was that it just smelt of huge government overreach, because if you control someone's money or eliminate access to it altogether, you essentially control how they can or can't move through society for the rest of their lives. It gets even more restrictive. So there are only a few places around town where Haibane are allowed to work. For example, Hikari works at the only bakery that Haibane can work at, not because it is special or prestigious in any way, which was an important point. I think it's actually quite the opposite, um, but because it is the oldest bakery in town. So why the oldest? We don't know, but there is definitely a theme that is forming where the haibane are only allowed to possess or interact with things that are old. I mean, even old home has the word old in it. So look, it's no secret that my first reaction to these rules was kind of negative because without more context, they seem to be punitive measures based on not on what you've done, but on who you are. And I hate to say it, but they did remind me of things like, you know, the Nuremberg laws or race segregation laws or any other identity based rule system that restricts the rights of a certain class of people more than others like where they can work and how they can interact with the rest of the population. And all sorts of justifications are given for enacting these sorts of rules. For example, that it is for the good of the group that is being restricted. But we all know that these rules always start off gradual and then they just snowball into something horrific. Thank God for Nightingale, who gave some legit reasons for why these restrictions on the high binary could be for reasons that aren't horrible. They wrote... I love shows like this where everyone takes away something different. The main thing I took from these two episodes is the theme of separation, in particular that of what is worldly and what is not. The Hibernaire's angelic characteristics set them apart from the citizens and in a way it makes sense that they aren't allowed to handle money given its worldly connotations. They are living in a town forbidden to even approach the wall surrounding it, which separates them from what's beyond. Raka asks a lot of questions and she mostly gets answered about things within. But beyond that, it is a great mystery. Thank you so much because this idea of separation is worth um, thinking more about. Clearly, there is a higher purpose for ensuring that the Haibane aren't merged into or tainted by the materialistic aspects of the world. Um, and actually, it reminds me of... Well, the fact that they're angels means that they are kind of holy beings and the word holy itself actually means to be separated out. So I think you're onto something there for sure. Maybe their purpose, the Haibane's purpose here is to meditate and sort of resolve issues of a more spiritual or internal character. And the best way to do that is to help them not have to handle money or be enticed by the newest, flashiest things that society can offer, hence the emphasis on only interacting with old things. So that does make sense to me. In practice, the Haibane Renme have implemented the separate but equal doctrine. And if Glee was a solely spiritual realm or some kind of purgatory, which it might very well be, um, that could work. But apply to actual society with actual human nature to contend with. We know from history that such a system always breaks down due to its inherent inequality, which is why the lens that, that we um, watch Hibana Renme with is so important. If we watch it purely with an eye for what it means symbolically and in terms of what the Hibana have to do um, or have to process spiritually and emotionally in order to move on from this place or be at peace with it, then the rules do make sense. But if you come at it from, um, as Ayo mentioned, sort of a materialist or a more realist perspective, and you imagine Glee as a town located in actual human reality, it does raise all sorts of problems. 
which are also interesting to think about hypothetically, even if it does lead to some uncomfortable conclusions. It's noteworthy that the rules that apply to Haibane are accepted by everyone. Um, the owner of the shop, for instance, knew that he was giving them the dirty dregs of the clothes section and knew that they could only take one piece each and even acknowledged that it's not um, easy being Haibane. And without more context, the passive acceptance of the Haibane being treated like this as a matter of policy felt wrong. Remember Hannah Arendt's term, the banality of evil? She used that phrase to describe how people can do evil deeds without evil intentions by detaching from how their everyday actions support an oppressive system. And sort of by not thinking about how the system looks and feels like from the viewpoint of the oppressed. And she wrote that in the context of trying to understand how a Nazi officer who was responsible for transporting Jews to concentration camps could still feel like he did nothing wrong because he was just doing his job. And I do know that we have broken Godwin's law already, but the point is, as a first time viewer, still trying to understand what Hibernate Renme is about, the question of whether the townspeople were inadvertently propping up a weird discriminatory system did pop into my mind. Again, there is every chance that nothing nefarious is going on, and um, even like the high bunny themselves act as if nothing is wrong. And I, I don't know if that's a good thing or not, but I could see how for them and for the townspeople, this is the only life that they have ever known. So why would they question how things are? Because that's how they have always been. Thrift shop guy was nice enough to kind of, you know, help cut wingslets into Raka's new outfit, but it was clearly a special one-off treatment. And the Haibane are used to like altering clothes themselves all the time. And what I took from that was uh, the point that it's them who have to adjust to this world. The world does not adjust to them. And I thought it was a neat metaphor for how after we are born into this world, we're all forced to learn ways to thrive or sometimes even just survive society. And some of us struggle a lot more than others. Um, for example, you know, people who are on the spectrum or are neurodivergent, and I'm not one myself, so I can't speak from personal experience, but they are thrown into this predicament of having to live in a world that doesn't understand who they are and doesn't adapt to their differences. Um, like in my old job, uh, my boss, super nice guy, he had to drop out of school because he had undiagnosed ADHD and mild dyslexia. So the school didn't adapt to his style of learning and his teachers kind of thought he was a bit of a dud. But then he went on to build like a hugely successful software company once he was freed from these externally applied standards that don't really work for everyone. Um, and so for a lot of people, it is a struggle just to be at home in your own skin, let alone have to learn all of society's rules of engagement. Um, and so kind of like Raka, you hopefully learn after stumbling around in the dark for a bit and, um, you know, making mistakes under pressure. And it is undeniable that there are perks to fitting in. You know, Raka was noticeably happier when she got that new outfit on and didn't stand out so much. And then um, later when the holder for her halo fell off, that very embarrassing holder, it just was another comforting sign that she is becoming less a fish out of water and more like the people around her. So even in Glee, to blend in socially matters and is even expected. So there's this weird um, mix of, okay, Glee might be a purgatory where the high binary are meant to resolve some deeper spiritual dilemmas, but it still has all of the trappings of normal human society and all, all of the expectations and relationships that come with that. Okay, so there's like a commotion going on at the Great Gate and we were introduced to the Togger. And the Togger are traders who come from somewhere from the outside to bring goods in and out of the town. Uh, but for some reason, they are heavily, heavily guarded. To be honest, I think it's a reasonable sort of jump to make that this sort of treatment 
does give off again sort of an uncomfortable sense of oppressiveness there is literally like an aggressive snarling snapping guard dog that's just sort of chomping away at the heels of the outsiders so in my mind i do relate that image to prisons and unless somehow the toga are like a notorious bunch of criminals who need to be watched like this i don't know why <laughs> it was such an aggressive show of force Anyway, for whatever reason, the Hibernian and May really don't want any outside influence touching this town. Um, and that aversion to external influence is best represented in these giant walls that surround Glee that neither the Hibane nor the human townspeople are allowed to step outside of. And it could be for their protection. We don't know. Maybe the Hibernian and May believe that they're protecting the people, but question remains open as to whether that is a justified way of thinking. Me personally, I, I'm inclined to set a very high bar for whether all of these restrictions, like the walls and the limits on the high bun and later the restrictions on free speech, but we, which we will talk about, um, whether they are all justified. I'm going to bring in another viewpoint because even though I keep reiterating my suspicion for why these rules are in place, I still am very open to the idea that the Hibane Ren may genuinely mean to help the Hibane and the townspeople. So from Ron Sturt Event, when I first watched these, my thought was more, well, these rules are somewhat arbitrary rather than oppressive. It is clear the Hibane have a fairly simple life enforced on them with all their needs met, even if a lot of it is secondhand. One thing you mentioned, I don't think they're required to check in and out of old home, but it's a way for the little family to track who is here or out. Yeah, thank you for that. That actually makes a lot of sense to me. <laughs> uh, so where my thoughts went. To the town of Glee, the Hibernet are in some ways, even though many of them are hatched as teenagers, newborn children. Raka is even referred to as such to the townspeople, and it becomes apparent, without spoilers, as the story progresses that the town and the walls are there for the Hibernet. Yeah, I do. I am curious to see how they go towards that conclusion, because um, at the moment I feel like I'm still missing a bit of context. Um, so children are born with no memories. They need to make them as they grow. Children are taken care of. All of their needs are met. They are given chores to do, just like the older Hibernia were required to do work, but the very young feathers aren't. Children are protected, and the Hibernia are as well by the walls, the townspeople, and the Hibernia Red May. In general, families are to some degree oppressive with the parents deciding a lot of your early life, true, with sometimes arbitrary rules. Why? Because I said so. Kids get a lot of secondhand stuff, um, they were the youngest by nine minutes, provided a place to live that they don't own and don't always get paid, etc. Look, I mean, super fair. I think you highlighted well why perspective matters. Like, we already talked about how if Glee is some kind of purgatory, that it makes sense that they're prevented from taking up the more materialistic or the commercial aspects of living. And now here is another perspective or possibility that the Haibane are essentially like kids and need to be protected. So again, as I said, I'm very curious to see why though. Um, and I wonder um, if we go this route, if there ever comes a time when a Haibane is mature enough to be allowed to go out on their own someone like Reki or Nemu appears to be of an age where you'd sort of expect them to not need these kinds of guardrails but clearly there is something um other than age that is holding them there or they haven't reached maybe a mental stage where they are judged to have the capacity of a normal person okay so back to this scene um the only person that's allowed to communicate with a togger is the communicator no one else is allowed near the outsiders um and also that works vice versa as well and the fact that the togga can only communicate using the designated sign language did raise another red flag for me um assuming we disregard the other theories that we have already talked about that might justify this kind of protection from the outside world but why did i initially react with like an Ugh? it's because to me um, restricting the use of speech to a privileged class often goes hand in hand with very tight control of the flow of information. And guys, I feel like, I think I'm coming across as this crazy libertarian, but I swear I'm not. Um, anyway, so here's my case. 
We know in Glee that there is no available information about what's beyond the walls. Um, And even if you go looking for knowledge, like it's not there, you know, just like the physical walls, that's likely by design. Effectively, the communicator and presumably the Hibernator and May are the only intermediary between any outsiders and the people inside Glee. So by monopolizing language, um, they monopolize knowledge and therefore power and there is no way for anyone else to check or question that power and it really honestly reminded me of when the catholic church restricted access to the bible by prohibiting translations of it into the more common people's native languages largely because the church selfishly wanted to preserve the immense power it had amassed over the centuries Um, so latin was the only language the bible was available in for hundreds of years until, of course, the Reformation happened and then people, you know, wanted to interpret the Bible for themselves, often at the risk of their very lives. So I keep making historical references um, and honestly, it's just so uncanny some of these ways and these restrictive rules that have been put in place. And I still, it's just a struggle for me as a student of history. (laughs) Like, it's just, it's hard to separate out reality, the grimy, um dirty reality of human history and then Hibernator and May, which is very likely um, a metaphor or an allegory for something entirely different. So it is true that the profits from trade go back to old home and also support the Hibernator kids, which is great, but I couldn't help thinking that these can also be things to keep people in line you know, um, put some nice things into someone's pocket in exchange for their unquestioning compliance. You know, just make them grateful for and dependent on your support. Now, at the end of the day, the levers of trade and commerce and knowledge, and therefore a potential pathway to independence, are solely controlled by the Hibernate Renme. And it also didn't help that Nemu very anxiously warned the group that they'd get into trouble if they hung around the wall for too long. It sort of came across as, oh, we don't even want to give the impression that we're even thinking about disobeying the Hibernate May or something bad will happen. It did not really <laughs> inspire confidence that this control structure is of the benevolent kind. But look, Again, I'm remaining open-minded and who knows, by the time that I finish this series, maybe I'll be like 100% pro Haibane Renmei. The Haibane Renmei accepted Raka into the family and requested her audience and Raka was like, huh, how do they already know my name? And it turns out that there was a perfectly reasonable explanation. They knew Raka wrote her name down at the thrift shop. Nothing dodgy there except, except putting my sus cap back on again. I actually don't think I ever removed it. Um, if you stop to think about it, the fact that they can only go to certain stores with a Hibane symbol on it and they can only exchange goods by writing their names down means that there is always eyes on where they go and what they do and who they interact with. Which brings us back to the issue that we have brought up now. Well, I have brought up now four or five times and I'm sure that you are all just sick of me constantly sussing the Hibane Red May, but it's gonna have to be a damn good reason for putting all of these restrictions and this surveillance in place. I reckon that the writers knew that there would be people like me with their tinfoil hats firmly on because we got Kana's joke about the Hibane Red May being a scary dark magic organization and I was like Did they put that joke in there, one, to call out the conspiracy theorists like me, and two, to subvert the expectation that they are evil and it'll actually turn out that they are this kind, benevolent protector? Or is there a double irony at play? Maybe they will turn out to be an organization with questionable morals after all, and it may not be that they're into the dark arts, but that they are holding on to some dark secrets that they feel the need to keep from the plebs. Episode two started with Raka searching for Reki and that dark foreboding hallway leading to her room sort of recalled the darkness, um, I think, in Reki's soul or like that dimly lit pathway that she spoke about symbolizing her search for meaning um, and the fact that things are really kind of falling apart and the walls are a bit scuff in contrast to the brightness of the guest room 
um, really sets Reki apart as a character who has, well, whose internal emotional landscape clashes with the external peacefulness of Glee. And as soon as you see her like hunched up on the ground, really scared about something that she's dreamt about with the sweat coming down her face, it's obvious that she's been haunted by something for a long time. And not only that, it's something that she really struggles to share with people. And in front of others, she always has this mask of confidence and of control. But I'm definitely getting more tortured artist vibes from Reki. And there's just something really not quite right with her soul. Maybe she tries painting what disturbs her in her dreams. When um, Raka asked, Reki really downplayed the value of her work and was very, very insistent that Raka does not enter her studio. And that reaction would make sense if what Reki is doing is expressing her pain through her work. Like it takes incredible trust and vulnerability to open up to someone about your deepest fears and your struggles. Obviously, she's not quite there yet with Raka, but worryingly, it doesn't seem like she's there with anyone in terms of that trust. So hopefully, as the show goes on, um, we'll see Reki grow in terms of being able to take that first step to just reach out to someone and be like, hey, I need to talk about this thing that's been weighing on me and that I've been dreaming of every single night. Um, it's of it's so bad and disturbing her sleep so much that she probably couldn't share a room with anyone. And I kind of got the feeling that that is what happened um, with Nemu. And that's why Nemu had to move out. You obviously can't be having these wild thrashing nightmares every night and room with someone who loves her sleep. So Raka and Hikari go to see the commander, the commander, sorry, the communicator at the temple which is on the outskirts of the outskirts of town. There's a, a mysterious and an untouchable aura about that already. Apparently it's also next to a graveyard, so people don't really go there unless they absolutely have to, which suggests that one, the townspeople are a little bit superstitious, and two, that maybe the high Hibernian may take advantage of that. You know, establishing a temple that is far away and protected by a sense of mysteriousness feels very much like a design by choice. In another sort of weird moment, Hikari told Raka that she was worried that the halo wasn't going to stick, and then Raka replied, it is, but it's stuck on a bit too much now, to which Hikari gave Raka like a meaningful look, but then refused to explain what that look meant. Um, and the impression that I got is that Hikari tends to um, hold back information, but not for any dodgy reason, Just it's just because she's like a little bit cheeky. And the chief example was later on when we found out why she wanted to be the halo bearer in the first place. You know, she has her own reasons for not voluntarily giving out certain information. I also get this feeling that she's a little bit of an airhead or doesn't really think things through too much. Like for one, she didn't think it necessary to prep Raka on what to expect when seeing the communicator. Um, and also that very, very dangerous path that they had to go on to get to the temple, maybe emphasizing that any sacred place, whether physical or metaphorical, is always a struggle to get to, um, was made even more dangerous having Hikari as a guide. Um, maybe she just has a really, really low sense of self-preservation. But yeah, just all these other little glimpses of Hikari that I thought were, you know, little interesting peaks into her character. The temple itself looked um, intimidating, to say the least. It looks like a very formidable fortress that's been carved into the side of a mountain. And they were greeted by another masked dude with a scythe, immediately conjuring up connections to death or the cycle of life and death or just some kind of soul harvester. Now, what was noticeable was how Hikari suddenly became all serious and warned Raka to not speak until she said so, in stark contrast to when Hikari was just totally unconcerned as they swayed precariously on that bridge, which you would think is the objective danger. But it was only here in the presence of the Habane Ren Mei did Hikari really have a weight to her warnings. And maybe that is indicative of where the real danger lies, or if it is not danger, at least the difference in her 
um, seriousness made me kind of sit up and go, well, even Hikari is being, you know, really serious about this now. It must be something important. But even this guy is not allowed to talk to them. Apparently, in the whole of Glee, only the communicator is allowed to communicate in all situations in an uninhibited way. The rest of them have to talk through using simple hand gestures and these bells that really limits longer form, more complicated communication. Also, once the bells are like placed around their wrists and on top of their wings, they can't move without announcing their presence. It's an effective cap on their freedom of movement. Um, it also didn't help that the bells around their wrists kind of look like manacles. <laughs> so here I go again with my usual crazy conspiracy theorist refrain. You know, I understand that there is probably a greater purpose behind these rituals and these rules. So I will contain myself and I will wait to see what they are. You know, I feel like I'm going to walk back my allergy to these rules and these rituals because I, I know that you know, it's like in different religions and cultures, there are just certain things that you do because that's what you do. You know, you don't really question like, oh, why, why do I have to do this? If say you're not in agreement with the rules for whatever reason, that's fine too. But if you are sort of in that place, um, you have to respect that religion or that culture, you know, it, you just kind of just go along with um, what is expected and that's sort of, you know, it's the way of peace, right? And since we're on religion, you know, there are a lot of religious connotations when it comes to the temple, which is literally called a temple, and also the communicator. So inside the temple was this like soaring dome with a circular opening at the top. You know what that reminded me of? It was exactly, almost exactly like the Pantheon in Rome, especially that Oculus at the top. And I have definitely been in like Raka's position, you know, kind of just staring incredulously at this massive sky opening in what was also a temple to the gods. So we're definitely getting some strong religious references there. And on top of that, who better to represent God than this booming voice of the unseen communicator summoning them into his presence with a question, what business do you have here? But it's not really a question that's looking for an answer because the communicator knows obviously and immediately goes on to pronounce who they are and for what purpose they're there it was a very um it's very typical god-like behavior you know addressing your subjects with rhetorical questions and showing your omniscience by answering them um, and when the communicator turned to Rucker to confirm her name again he already knew like so what reason would you have for asking someone a question whose answer you already know? And I think it was more like he was testing her. You know, the question was being asked not so much to enlighten the asker, but to see if the one being questioned really knows themselves. And a significance of Raka knowing the name that she's been given in this world um, is that as soon as she started referring to herself as Raka, that sort of marked a break between her old life and the new one that she's been born into. And clearly the Haibane Renmei are invested in making sure that the Haibane accept and adapt to life in Glee under their watch. So the name itself is just representative of the choice, I think, to let go of their past lives or to somehow live differently than before. You know, despite knowing her name, Raka really struggled to answer because she's been kind of forced to use her wings to communicate. Um, so look, even if you were to have a benign reading of the communicator, I do, you know, one has to really wonder why they restrict how others can express themselves. Um, I don't know, maybe it's just because of their wings form a part of their wholly set apart identity it's a way to train them into getting into that mindset of, okay, I really have to sort of learn to be comfortable in this body and to learn what my role is as a haibane. Other religious parallels include how the kanji for communicator is washi. So literally word or speech master. 
And all credit to Carl Knapp for putting me onto that. Uh, by the way, I learned so much from your wall text, which is amazing. Um, wall texts are most definitely welcome on this channel. So thank you so much. And I would highly recommend people read up on Carl's comment to get more context on the kanji and just how much more someone who can read kanji can pick up on what other religious parallels were there. Okay, so inside of the temple is a garden, you know, potentially a reference to the biblical Garden of Eden and kind of just like how God laid down rules for humans to follow without really explaining why it's more, um, you know, these are the rules and you have to follow them. And God also gave humans responsibility for looking after the garden in exchange for like a secure life living there. The communicator's interaction with Raka basically reinforces that similar sort of obligatory relationship where the Haibane have an obligation to the organization and to the town in exchange for living a fairly comfortable sort of worry-free life. As someone with the authority to bestow belonging, the communicator officially recognizes Raka as a Haibane and then gave her that notebook that guarantees her daily life, which interestingly was exactly the same way that Nemu had phrased it before, suggesting that to some extent there is a little bit of regurgitation that happens. The Haibane get told something and then they absorb it to the point where they themselves reflect that same teaching or belief. And we see that happening with Raka already. So the communicator told Raka that in exchange for this guaranteed life, she has to then go find work in town. And then Raka later repeated this back to Reki by offering to help cook. So the indoctrination around having to be a good haibane for everyone else's sake is already being internalized by Raka. Now, I don't use the word indoctrination necessarily as a bad thing. Um, I'd liken it to agreeing to something like the social contract in, you know, Thomas Hobbes's Leviathan. In exchange for certain limits to your freedom, you get to live in like relatively secure and in a relatively secure and peaceful environment. And it's like if you become a citizen of a country, you have certain obligations to obey laws and pay your taxes, etc. Um, and it also comes with being recognized as being a protected part of a larger group. The murkiness comes in, I suppose, when you start to debate over to what extent rules should be set by, um, well, not necessarily set by, but set with the input from the people who have to follow those rules. And then that's when you get into these huge debates around the benefits of a democracy versus an autocracy. And we will not get into that today, but seeing how this town is run suggests that we are in more of a benign autocracy than anything else. Reki is like having the time of her life being bullied by the Young Feathers again. And we also met the house mother. She is like a tough old bird, but with sort of a, like a soft side, kind of like Reki and is importantly not a Haibane. So another human that has this incredibly close connection to the Haibane. We also learned that she raised Reki too and has clearly dealt with her fair share of Reki's rebelliousness, but they do seem to have a fairly good relationship. So I did enjoy getting all these little snippets of Reki's childhood, like the fact that she used to run away a lot and it could have been like the other kids where she was just running away because she was forced to eat carrots, but I do wonder if there was another reason for her wanting to get away from the place, like maybe being unable to accept her new identity or even just missing home um, where she came from and being unable to deal with the fact that she's stuck in this place. The scene where the kids are just refusing to eat their veggies is too relatable uh, and it turned into like this cute interaction where Reki conned Raka into eating the carrots instead. And also, did you guys notice that slight irony in how they inverted the phrase carrot and stick? In this case, it was the carrots that became the stick and then the pancakes that became the carrot. But anyway, it's a very nerdy observation that really tickled my fancy. Um, anyway, anyway, the important thing was that it's rare to see Reki smile so much and have fun. Her playful side only really comes out with the kids and with Raka. And also, interestingly, she doesn't really treat the, com I say commander again, 
was about to communicator. She doesn't treat the communicator as someone to revere or to fear like the others do. And maybe Reki knows something that they don't, or maybe it's just a side effect of being a bit older and more experienced and that much more jaded. But I thought it was noteworthy that that is something else that sets Reki apart from the other Haibane. There is like a jadedness to her that hasn't dented her kindness to others, but it does give you the feeling that she hides a lot of melancholy and I guess dissatisfaction with her current state in life underneath all that teasing um, and that there remains in her this streak of rebelliousness um, even though she seems settled into Glee, uh, given that she's been there for the longest. We ended the episode confirming that Hikari did in fact use the Halo mold to make donuts, which is quite sacrilegious and I loved it. You know, there is a lot of pomp in how the Hyman Everyone may present themselves, so to turn something so symbolic and significant into something for making baked goods was a fun twist. And it kind of fit how the Haibane, though they are angelic in appearance, still deal with the drudgery of everyday life. Their wings, their halos, all of these typically spiritual, otherworldly symbols are sort of brought back down to earth in a really grimy and practical sort of way. Um, like the wings, they burst out um, on their backs in this bloody mess and they have to be brushed and cleaned. The halo is like made in a fry pan and has to be attached on manually. And then they all have to find work. It's not like they live in this celestial heaven where you laser around all day and fly around on clouds. So tying it back to the existentialist sort of theme, the Hypana's lives reflect the existentialist sense that philosophy and meaning starts with the practical immediate experiences of everyday life as opposed to abstract principles or concepts. That's why watching Haibane gives me such an odd, um, ambiguous feeling. You know, we're watching these angelic beings and yet their lives in Glee are far from the angelic ideal and it, it just something feels a bit off about you know, the fact, like, is this heaven? Is it not heaven? Is it some sort of weird in between? I've ranted way too much. And I think it's actually time to get to the episode. So episode four of Hibernate Ren May. Here we go. It's time to sing this in three, two, one, play. Birds flying over the walls. Hmm. Another dream. Maybe she is turning into Reki. Not just any bird, it's a crow. It's your soul animal. It's like the tolling of temple bells, like the Haibana Renmei being like, hey, come back to us, lost child. <laughs> Do not chase the freedom crow. Kana. <laughs> Honestly, that is the worst way to wake someone up. <laughs> Appropriately, it's kind of waking Rucka up because she's the one who hates crows. <laughs> that looks like that would hurt and be extremely painful. Hey, she's got pajamas with the wing slits at the back. Hmm.
So it's a bird feed. Hey, thought a waste. <laughs> Man, this hate goes deep. <laughs> Speaking of crows, trash. <laughs> Okay, so somehow Rack is going to have to unlearn her natural affinity with crows. Hmm. It feels so much like an allegory to how, you know, sometimes what your inner nature is telling you is in direct opposition to what the rest of the world is telling you to think. Oh, crows are smart birds. <laughs> uh, she's like yeah do not let those crows steal your soul okay interesting here we go with the rules again. Obviously the Hibana Red may have set this rule where we can't attract crows so that they don't live inside the town. Interesting. Okay. Well, that changes things. It's more um, a rule for the good of the crows so that they keep their independence. But then why are the high banner being kept inside the walls? Is it because they're not equipped yet to be independent? <laughs> The thing is, is the goal of the Hibernate Remei to make the Hibernate into independent creatures, you know? Hmm. That's a very fancy pocket watch. A clock tower or something? <laughs> hey, there we go again with like the barter system. Hmm. <laughs> Man, they're really hammering home that they cannot use anything that's new. I knew it! A kind of... I mean, I'm assuming Kana is allowed to be here. Mm hmm. Doesn't this go against the rule of, you know, you can only stick to old things? Electricity seems like something that they should, the Hibernate shouldn't touch.
it's really great seeing Krenner's fashion for fixing things. Mechanics. Also, this clavichord music, <laughs> really hammering home the oldness of this place. <laughs> mm, better if it's coffee. Yeah, fantas fantastic idea. <laughs> You're late for work or something. Dragging her by the halo again. <laughs> I kind of feel bad for Raka. You know, first it was Hikari making it across that, like, super dangerous bridge. Now it's, you know, kind of trying to kill her on a bike. Hey, where does Kana work again? <laughs> uh. Oh, they actually, they work at a clock repair shop. Tough ass, but with a soft side. Kind of seems like the norm here. What? Wait, does he not know the rules that the hyper I have to live by, or he's just being a hard ass on purpose? Okay, it just seems like he's being a hard ass. Okay, it, you know what? It seems like all the townspeople, a hundred percent of them, are really nice to the high banner. You know, tough but nice. <laughs> Clock won't get drunk.
Hey, Raka. Yes, keep asking these important questions. Does that circular logic? We have to do things because we have to do them. <laughs> hmm. So they work to not feel indebted to people who just naturally want to protect them. <laughs> Can't push Raka too hard. She doesn't really seem to have like much of a sense of humor. I do really feel for Raka though, just trying to figure out where you fit in. It's like those teenage years. It's annoying teenage years where you're just really not quite comfortable with yourself. It's such a classic European town. I love it. Hmm. Like a crow. The tower is at the bottom. Oh. So you can leave, but if you leave, you're not allowed to, I guess, be under the protection of the town anymore. You're on your own. Hmm. Huh. So it's like the birds carry their connections to the past away from them and out of the town. I don't know why I just had this thought like that there will come a point where Raka wants to jump off because she wants to fly like the birds. I don't know. That's an odd thought. <laughs> Man. Ah, uh, so uh, these little things that they say really to emphasize the separation between the human population and the high bunny, and yet they're kind of just like they're protecting them in a way, but also they can't get too close to them. Wait, what? Where would kind of go? Hmm. Maybe they do work once you sort of break through some kind of mental 
burial. I feel like we learned so much this episode. I'm <laughs> just trying to process it. Yes, it was helpful. She means Kana. <laughs> <laughs> Just pulled a hikari there. Yes, that was what was so odd. It's like they're born with all of these um, inherent abilities already, except for the memories. <gasps> hey, connecting with your past through music. That always works. <laughs> oh <laughs> oh man i so many things to think about um one kana does not hate crows two the fact that crows carry things from their past lives or the things that they've forgotten inside the cocoon outside the walls that's interesting um, and also three, I loved that Raka eventually asked what I was asking is like, why do the high money feel like they have to work? Well, actually they're told that they have to work. Um, so one, it's sort of like a, an expectation that's set on them by the high banner Renmei, but also they feel indebted to the town for protecting them, I guess, providing shelter for, it seems providing some other kind of protection against some as yet unknown thing or entity that we haven't really learned about yet. And so in order to sort of pay back the townspeople for the protection, the Habane work for free or not for free. They just work there and sort of exchange things. Okay, we'll sit on those new pieces of information for now and uh, jump to the next episode, episode five, and then we'll do a sum up at the end. So. You guys are good to go. Let's do this in three, two, one, play. The beginning of the world and abandoned factory. Oh, we're in the library with Nemu. Nice. I wonder what those books are all about, like, if there's no information about what's beyond those walls, what is in those books, then... Mm. Oh. Like, maternity leave. I always thought I'd love to work in a library, but just reading stories from people who actually have worked in libraries, it's uh, not, it's an idealized job for sure. Is that 
I'm dead on Raka's like dress. That's not exactly the high banana symbol, right? Hey, <laughs> boss lady. <laughs> it reminds me of that comment about how, you know, they're not kids per se, but they're called newborns. The crow was protecting her, wasn't it? It's odd now. Now she's been protected from the crows, it seems like. Well, that was deep. But how? Oh my goodness. Huh. Maybe they should be wearing gloves. How can a book disintegrate like that unless it's like a few hundred years old? <laughs> I mean, what's inside the books is what I want to know. Like, how can they be from the outside world? and yet not contain any information about what's in the outside world. But how? how? <laughs> what is it? Maybe it's just history? But even then that would sort of speak to what's outside the town. Ugh, what a fascinating life journey. It's like, maybe we're all born with the curiosity to know where we came from and how it all started, but on the other hand, why pursue answers that don't really add to your life right now? You know, why not just enjoy life, find meaning in what you do now in the everyday? Hmm. Storybook lady. Oh, it's part of her duties. What is that? A story of the communicator? <laughs>
Hmm. It's more a public library now as opposed to an academic one. <laughs> oh, I thought she was going to say no. <laughs> Is Raka going to ask Nemu about Reki? <laughs> yeah, same. <laughs> These on display are like really old books, I'm assuming. Like ancient texts. I mean, she found a secret book, like a banned book. There's been no effort to preserve these old books that potentially could hold some information about what's outside. Like, that is not the focus of life here. <laughs> and probably not of the hyper in there either. Maybe it suits their purpose that people don't know. Why are they sneaking around on Reki? Is Reki some part of like bike gangster? <laughs> huh. What the heck is happening? Oh man, these are the racist humans. Oh no. Whoa, hang on. Wait, they're all high bunny. <laughs> what the? Man, did we just. Ah, oh, did Reki used to run around with these, I guess, deadbeat high bunny <laughs> that kind of don't work? Just kind of lays around, smoke, drink, cause all sorts of trouble. Abandoned factory. No. <laughs> Damn, the hibernate are segregated into the good ones and the bad ones. And the bad ones are literally called, like, from the abandoned factory. Wait, there are no older boys in Old Home, you're right. Why is it so gendered? Hmm.
Wait, she doesn't feel like she deserves to be supported in that way? Also, it's interesting that the others are telling Raka that she shouldn't be feeling like she belongs somewhere else. Even though they clearly came from somewhere else before they were born here. Hmm. The beginning of the world. <laughs> Okay, so it's okay for them to research things like that. It's not there's not a banned list of topics or anything. Did Nemu also give up on the quest to find information about the outside world? There we go, the creation story. Nemi. It's kind of like you write your own story. <laughs> Doesn't matter what the true story is, you just make it what you want it to be, I guess. Is a possible deeper reading of that. Is that Kana fixing the cocktail? Oh no, that's the cocktail in the town. A, like seedling <gasps> Nemo is an author Wait, don't we get the story? <laughs> oh, come on. They all fly over the walls as crows. <laughs> it's so fascinating that they're literally, well, Nemu is literally writing their own story of how they came to be. And she gets to choose or decide how it ends. Again, just touching on the existentialist philosophy of writing your own story, making your own choices. Hmm. Like a silly ending. Wait, we don't get Raka's suggestion either. <laughs> Backhanded compliment. <laughs> That's cool, just hanging around in the bar, earning his keep, her keep.
Wait. Is Kira a boy or a girl? <laughs> wait, was that Saya not a more permanent? Like, wait, what? Why is Koo saying bye bye to everything and everyone? Yeah, Koo's being weird. <laughs> Just. Okay, that was that was a weird cut. On brand. Personal project. I want to know about the Hibernate like Hibernate gang wars. <laughs> Sleeping on the back of the bike. <laughs> it was a mistake. Hmm. Well, the crows feature in this story. Okay, that's creation of humans. Oh my god, the Hibane are the mistakes. <laughs> no. An in between place. God. Oh, God. <sighs> you know, I know that the creation story or the story of the beginning of the world is only Nemu's retelling of it. Obviously, we don't know what the original story said, but let's say we take it as it is, right? The fact that the High Bane, or legend has it, or at least in Nemu's head, the Haibane 
uh, mistaken creations. They were sort of like the first stuff up and then God was like, yeah, I don't want these guys. Like, let me just make better, more perfect um, creatures that are in my image. And then the humans came out. Is awful. Like, imagine um, growing up sort of being told, oh, you're a mistake, but then you were allowed to live, I guess, because God is infinite in his mercy and just like, you know what, you guys can have your little weird sort of in between us. Uh, <laughs> it's so, man. Okay, let me think about that. Okay, so here are my broad thoughts from watching these two episodes, and I would love to know what you guys think. So I do like that they are developing the law around crows and how they relate to the town and to the Haibane and specifically to Raka. So we know that Raka feels an affinity with crows and throughout episode four, um, you could see her express that by leaving food out for them and generally trying to make their lives easier by providing what they need to them. But then in came Kana to be like, damn, no, you can't do that. You can't feed them because then they'll develop a dependency on you and they, then they won't know how to survive outside of the walls of this town. So it seems like there are rules in place for the crows too for their own good. So Kana's behavior towards them, although seemingly sort of very mean and unwelcoming, was really in line with that um, for their greater good sort of thinking, which um, to me it kind of felt analogous to how the Haibana Ren Mei enforce very strict rules on the haibane but it is for their good the only key and very very important difference is unlike the crows the haibane are actively um encouraged to live their lives dependent on the protection of the townspeople and of the haibane renmei um and they're discouraged from things like even approaching the town's walls so I think where it'll get interesting is just the question of does the Haibane Renmei eventually want the Haibane to go out on their own, just like the crows? Or if a Haibane, say like Raka, who has time and time again wondered quite nostalgically about whether the town and the family that she was originally from still exists somewhere beyond the walls, like what if someone like that ever wanted to leave and how would they go about getting permission to do that? Or would they ever be granted permission to leave Glee when it just feels like everything is set up to lead them away from having any sort of those um, thoughts of independence? In a kind of incomplete answer to that, um, I feel like what well, we did, we learned that the townspeople and I think even the high bunny can actually leave town. So at the very least, there appears to be some semblance of choice. Um, for example, it was um, it was Kana's employer who was like, oh, it feels like one day she's just going to fly away with those wings of hers. And then in the episode where we met um, Nemu's colleague in the library, um, Sum Sumika, she talked about thinking about leaving, but not doing it in the end because she figured out that life in Glee was pretty sweet and that staying there was much more satisfying than venturing outside and actually um satisfying that curiosity of what was out there and i feel like there was so much symbolism wrapped up in these tiny conversations especially questions around like what does it mean to live your best life or the most meaningful or most satisfying life and at this stage it's kind of hard to tell which way the story wants us to lean. Like, is it better to just be content with where you are right now and find meaning in the circumstances that you're already in? Or is it better to like maintain a strong and a, like a vivacious sort of curiosity and keep pushing to expand your borders and eventually, you know, venture out into the unknown. And I, I mean, I suspect that the story won't push a better way. The important thing really is that we even think about these sorts of questions and then, as in the very existential sense, decide what would be the better option for yourself. And then in episode five, we got the story of the beginning of the world, 
which is basically the origin story of the Haibane, but as told by Nemu, which was really interesting. So it, you know, can we treat it as confirmed or accurate law? And does it actually accord with reality? Probably not. Um, it's, I think, I mean, I think it's probably more of a reflection of Nemu's internal thinking um, because the original story itself was lost. But again, the focus should be on the fact that it was Nemu who took the initiative to fill in the blanks herself. And I think that says something deeper about how we all individually are constantly writing and rewriting our own histories. Um, and we do that to sort of make sense of who we are today. Um, because by looking back and filling in the gaps or making sense of things that we can't be sure of 100% that happened in the past, um, it allows us to understand who we are today. Like we tend to create these narratives about how we became the person we are, which then enables us to sort of control the kind of person we, we continue to become into the future. So I feel like the stories that we tell about ourselves reflect the kind of person that we think we are right now. Um, and what an interesting take Nemi had on how the Haibane came into existence. Essentially, according to her retelling, Haibane were mistakes by God, you know, and I kind of like already had a big meltdown about this because I was like, what? <laughs> That's, that sounds so horrible. Um, basically, so God considered the Haibane to be a failure because they were too similar to him, which is an odd reason to, you know, think something is a failure. But I guess maybe there's sort of some kind of egotistical God. Definitely not a fully benevolent, you know, perfect God that exists in certain religions. So what happened was stuffed up with the Haibane's according to his point of view, and then return to the drawing board to then create humans who didn't have the wings and the halos. And the Haibane in the meantime were meant to be erased, presumably from existence. I still feel like it's such a, a horrible origin story, especially if you are a Haibane. What I found so curious about it is firstly that the god in this story is the kind to make mistakes. You know, none of this perfectly omnipotent stuff. And then secondly, um, you know, it was God, again, from Nomi's perspective, who made the Haibane's wings charcoal grey. It kind of felt sort of as a cursed mark, you know, something to say that the Haibane are not meant to be, that something is wrong with them. And if that's the case, then I would totally understand why someone like Reki would be feeling so down about themselves because... How do you even continue on or how do you make sense of your life when you are told or you feel like um, your life or being born even was a mistake? Uh, yeah, that is a horrible, horrible, I guess, psychological state to be in. And I don't know, I feel like it's saying something deeper about potentially depression or just something not quite right with with the mind um, and through no fault of the person themselves or the haibane. Don't even know if I'm making sense. <laughs> um, anyway, what else was interesting about the story? Um, oh, that the town of Glee is actually an in-between place. Um, I think it was between the sky and the earth. So um, it definitely adds credence to what some of you were telling me, which is that the haibane are actually being protected. By the town and the townspeople and the Haibane Renme. Like maybe what the Haibane are being protected from is literally being wiped from existence. You know, and I wonder if, you know, pairing it with the fact that the Haibane seem to be able to leave, I wonder if there are certain conditions that they have to meet before they are allowed to do that. Maybe they have to change form somehow. Like something to do with their charcoal grey wings or something. Like I feel like the colour grey again increasingly seems like a mark that means you're not ready yet or something's still wrong with you uh, so maybe it has something to do with the color again just bringing it back to gray like the color green and the name of the town it just kind of is all fitting together also again because this is Nemu telling the origin story um, I assume there was always going to be some level of self-insertion in there and sure enough it was only because God fell asleep that they were able to escape 
um, and that he was like, ah, oh, can't be bothered now, you know, you guys can live, but only in this very contained bubble of glee. So I don't know if she's she was alluding to some kind of mistake that she herself made or maybe it's just an insight into Nemu's character, you know. She's like, ah, oh, I'm so tired and sleepy, I can't be bothered, <laughs> you know, fixing my mistake and so here. Let's just just have at it and oh, we'll see how the mistake goes, see how it runs. Like, I don't know. And finally, well, not finally, because there was just a lot of things in those two episodes that I think we will get more into the next time. But the thing that w- had a big shock factor <laughs> was the fact that uh, Reki um, was in a rebel gang of Haibane previously. Um, and that there is still uh, a group of them that run around, um, I guess, from the so-called abandoned factory. Again, the name itself says it all, right? These are probably high banner who don't um, make the effort to fit in or to find jobs or don't follow the rules and have been segregated away from the rest of the high banner, um, which is... Look, it's definitely an interesting development. I wonder, you know, I'd have to think more about, okay, what does the existence of this renegade group of Haibane mean? Is it just meant to symbolize the kind of people who refuse to, um, I guess, give up on their instincts to be independent, who don't understand why the Haibane need to enforce these strict rules and want to make a stand in some way you know are they bad or is it just another expression of the frustration that naturally would come when you wake up in a town having no memories of your past life and struggling really to make sense of your current life so i really would love to find out more about what's up with that group and how Becky escaped or broke away from that group and um yeah just what went down in the past so yes so much fresh fodder to hunker down on with these two episodes and i think i'm going to call it a day here i really look forward to reading your comments again just put in and out there wall texts are more than welcome and i do love reading all of the comments to just learn um high better anime is continues to be uh, a show that makes you think twice and three times about what exactly it's saying because I feel a lot of the times what's being said um is a lot deeper than what's actually being shown on screen so yeah thank you guys so much for joining me and I look forward to the next time we get to watch the more Haibane Red May uh in the meantime take care and I'll see you next time